Good evening to everybody. It is certainly good to see all who are able to make it out to our afternoon worship services. And we're thankful for everybody's presence. Uh, for a few Sundays now, we've been going through a new series as the teachers, and that has been just briefly named the Why series. And that is we've been trying as the teachers to address some what I would call Christian fundamentals, some basic questions. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily easy questions or certainly not necessarily simple questions for someone to answer, but they are some of the foundational principles of who we are as Christians, what we think as Christians, and why we do what we do and the way we do those things as New Testament Christians. And the ones that I've been able to hear so far, I've been very appreciative of the brothers' study and the ways that they have presented uh, the answers to these important questions. And tonight we come to a question that in some ways is very basic, and yet in other ways has not been basic to the religious world at large, and is one of the reasons that there are some problems and confusion amongst denominational Christianity. And the question that we have before us tonight is, why do Christians rely on the New Testament? And what I mean by that, to explain that just a little bit further, why do we base everything that we do and everything that we believe and everything that we practice on the teachings of the New Testament? Now, as I hope to show, I do not believe in any sense that the Old Testament is unimportant or that it is not Scripture. I'm going to try and show tonight that it is Scripture and it is important and there is value in the Old Testament. But do we get our authority from either the Old or the New Testament? Or do we only get authority for what we do and what we believe and what we practice from the New Testament? Now, it's not that the Old and the New Testaments are contradictory. I don't want to make it sound like we might believe something if we read the Old Testament and believe something different if we believe the New. That's not the case at all. But when it comes to what we do, when it comes to how we're saved, when it comes to how we worship, when it comes to our ethics and behavior, while there in all of these cases may be some things that are very similar and may even be things that carry over from the Old to the New Testament, my belief is that we have to find our authority in the New Testament. And when we say, when we authorize a practice, uh, be it in worship, be it in ethics or morality, because we find an example of it or a command pertaining to it in the Old Testament, but not in the New, then I believe we have gone astray. And that is a lot of what happens sometimes in denominational Christianity. When people look at the Church of Christ and they see some of the differences, and one of their reasons when we talk to them about things, of why they may do certain things, is, well, it's in Scripture, it's in the Old Testament. And so we have to be able to address that. And so that's part of our goal tonight. Uh, like the others have said when they've taught, I suppose there's many different ways you may be able to tackle this question. And so I hope that the way that we go through it tonight is helpful in some way as we try and answer the question about why we rely on the New Testament. Now, first of all, what I want to say, uh, I want to talk a little bit about covenants and testaments. And I think we need to kind of understand this. Now, in some ways, these are synonyms. And in certain areas, you may be able to interchange the word covenant and testament. And yet, in other ways, they're not quite inter interchangeable. Uh, they're very similar. But when we talk about the Old and the New Testament, obviously, we're speaking about two sections of the Bible. The Old Testament is the first section, the first 39 books of the Bible. The New Testament is the last 27 books of the Bible. But when it comes to covenants, uh, there's a little bit of a difference. Now, I've heard people ask, and I've even asked people before, before I really thought about it, how many covenants are there? And the typical answer, you'd say, well, there's two. There's the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And that's not an inaccurate answer completely, because the Bible even speaks in terms of the first and the second. But there's actually more than just two covenants. In fact, we read about a covenant, uh, several covenants, in the Bible, for example, in Genesis chapter 6, we read that God made a covenant with Noah. And he made a covenant after the flood. We read about this in Genesis chapter 9, that he would never flood the entire world uh, with water again. 
And so there were covenant, a covenant. And a covenant is simply an agreement. You can think of it in simple terms like a contract, but it's an agreement between God and His people, or God and an individual, or a group of people. And so God made a covenant with Noah. God made a covenant with Abraham. You can read, and it's called a covenant. In Genesis 15, in Genesis 17, in Exodus 2, verse 24, it references God's covenant with Abraham. Of course, what we typically consider or are considering when we talk about the Old Covenant, we're talking about the Law of Moses, the covenant that God made. And that's the language, that is language that's used. God made a covenant with Israel. And you can read about that there in Exodus chapter 19, the giving of the Ten Commandments, and then the uh, continual giving of the Law. That was a covenant between God and the nation of Israel. And also we're told that God made a covenant with David. And it's specifically called a covenant in 2 Chronicles 7 and 2 Chronicles 21. Now, what we see is all of these covenants, and there's four right there, are all recorded in the Old Testament. And so the Old Testament actually teaches us about several different covenants. Some of them it only speaks of very briefly. But there's actually several covenants that are mentioned in the Old Testament. On the other hand, there is the New Covenant which is actually foretold of in the Old Testament. In Jeremiah 31, which we'll reference tonight, it actually speaks of and God promises a new covenant, and then that new covenant is revealed and recorded in the New Testament. And that's why we rely on the New Testament, is because, to kind of skip to the end, we are under the new covenant. That's what the Bible calls it, the new covenant, a better covenant. That is the covenant of Christ. And I think this is important. The reason I wanted to show this is when we look at it this way, I think it helps us understand why we don't live under the old covenant. Because we don't live under any of the old covenants. I've seen uh, uh, the, the picture that's in my mind is Keith Thompson does this masterfully. When I, I've had the opportunity to travel with Keith and Mike, and especially in Africa, where we'll go around and we'll have studies. And we'll study with people about the church. And almost invariably, when we start talking about the church and worship practices, uh, instrumental music may come up. And they will typically say, well, but in the Old Testament, in Psalms, they use instruments, and David used instruments, and so on. And Keith's a master about this. And he'll go back to Genesis 6, and he'll say, now, God had a covenant with Noah. Noah was supposed to build an ark, and he had to build it this long and this tall and this wide. And then he'll stop and he'll say, now, do you have to build an ark? And of course they say, well, no. He says, do I have to build an ark? And they, they see, and they start seeing very quickly. We understand we don't live, we're not bound by the covenant that God had with Noah. And you and I are not bound by the covenant that God had with Abraham. We're, bless, we're recipients of the blessings of that covenant. But you and I don't have the covenant that Abraham had with God. You and I don't have the covenant that David had with God. And if we can see that about these other covenants, then I think that should help us see we also are not part of the covenant that's recorded in the Old Testament that is God's covenant with Israel. These were special covenants, uh, temporary covenants with people or groups of people. And while we learn a lot from them, We are not under them. We are under the new covenant. And that's, again, why the New Testament is so important. So, again, typically when we're talking about the covenants, we're talking about the law of Moses and the new covenant. But I hope that helps us see why, just one reason, why we are not under the old covenant law of Moses. We're not under any of the old covenants. Let's speak for a little while about the law of Moses. As we learn what the law of Moses is, hopefully it helps us understand why we are not under the law of Moses in any sense. And I want to make that very clear. We are not under the law of Moses at all. None of the law of Moses, as the law of Moses, pertains to Christianity. Now, there are parts of the law of Moses that are nearly identical to the law of Christ. There are certainly elements that have been carried over from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. But we live under the new covenant laws. And so while it was sinful to commit murder in the Old Testament, that was one of the Ten Commandments, the reason it's wrong to commit murder under the New Testament is not because of the Old Covenant law, 
but because it's wrong and sinful to commit murder under the new law of Christ. In fact, Christ even restricts that even further. And we see it's also wrong to hate your brother. And it's wrong to hate others. It's wrong to do violence. It's expanding. And I say that because there's a misnomer, a misunderstanding. A lot of Christians believe that we are still bound by the Ten Commandments. You and I do not live by the Ten Commandments. They're a wonderful set of rules and they teach us a lot of good things. And again, I think all of them in principle to a degree, one or, uh, lesser or greater, are applied in the New Testament. But you and I do not live under the New Testament. We don't live under the law of Moses. And let's, So let's just look at the law of Moses for a little while. First of all, the law of Moses was given to the nation of Israel. The law of Moses was never given to mankind in general. And that should be the first clue that the law of Moses was, as we're going to see in a moment, temporary. Because God's covenant with Abraham, remember we talked about God had a covenant with Abraham, pre-exists the covenant with Israel. And yet that covenant with Abraham, and Paul uses this as an argument in the book of Galatians, God's covenant with Abraham was that through him, through his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So there was worldwide global blessing as a promise, as one of God's parts of the covenant with Abraham. But the covenant with the Israelites was just that. It was just for Israel. Now other people could benefit from it to a degree, but the covenant or the law of Moses was for the nation of Israel. And Paul shows how this uh, makes the old law obsolete over in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 11 through 16, and I'm not going to read all of this. For those of you that take notes, I'm going to have some passages up here that you can write down. For time's sake, we're not going to read the lengthier ones. But in Ephesians 2, Paul is showing how Jew and Gentile have been unified and they have become one because the old law has been done away with. Because Christ has done away with the enmity and broken down in His flesh, it says, the dividing wall of hostility. And what he's speaking thereof is he has done away with the division that existed in the old covenant system because the old covenant was just for Israel. You and I could not be full participants in the law of Moses because we're not Jewish, we're not Israelites. And so clearly it was not for us. But secondly, the law of Moses was not perfect. It was not faultless. In fact, Hebrews 8 verse 7 says, For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now, why was there a fault? Was, did God make some type of mistake? Well, no, God didn't make a mistake. It was never designed to be the perfect promise or the perfect solution to man's problem. It was not designed. The, the, the covenant with Israel had a purpose, but that purpose was not to bring or be the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham. It wasn't to be the way that God fulfilled His promise to mankind back in Genesis 3 when He promised to deal with the problem of sin. And so it wasn't perfect. It wasn't faultless. Uh, in Hebrews 10 verses 1 and 2, it says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. So first of all, this shows us again the imperfection. It was not designed as, if you'll accept this language, the real thing. It was a shadow of what was to come. The law of Moses was always, at best, a shadow of what God's full plan was. Now, that doesn't mean it was a bad system. It was a God-given system. It was a divinely given system. But it was by God's design only a shadow, a prefigurement of what His full plan really was. Verse 2 says, Otherwise would they, not, uh, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. This is something that's developed even further in the book of Hebrews. But that is the other idea of why this system was not perfect, why it was uh, not faultless, and that is that it could not fully forgive men of their sins. Now that's what God's working towards. That's what God really promised back in the garden 
when he said that there was going to come from the seed of woman one who would crush the head of the serpent, God is promising there is going to come one who deals with the problem of sin. That promise was not about animal sacrifices. That promise was about Jesus. Now all those animal sacrifices in between served a purpose, and God wanted those, and God commanded those. But the blood of bulls and goats and rams and sheep, as the Hebrew writer said, had no power, had no ability to truly absolve man of his sin. The blood of animals, the blood of a creature that was created less than man, could not make up for the sin of man. It would be illogical to think that it could, no matter how many millions and millions of animals you slaughtered. And thus, the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, was not a faultless system. And because of that, it was only temporary. It was never meant, the law of Moses, to be the end-all, be-all covenant between God and His people. And we see this even in the Old Testament. I referenced this already, but Jeremiah 31, and again, I'm not going to read all of these verses. You can read them later, but I just want to point out a few parts here. The Lord says through Jeremiah, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And so as Israel has already fallen by the days of Jeremiah, and Judah is in the midst of falling, God says, I'm not just going to bring you back and continue this covenant. There is coming a day when I am going to establish a completely new covenant. Verse 33 speaks about that covenant that he will make with the house of Israel and write it on their hearts and he will be their God and they will be his people. He, Jeremiah was not speaking about just some renewed covenant when the Jewish people came back from Babylonian captivity. He was speaking of the New Testament or the new covenant as brought about by Jesus. And you can see this and we know this beyond the shadow of a doubt because these verses are quoted by the Hebrew writers as proving that the Old Testament was never meant to last forever. It was temporary. Now again, that doesn't mean it was useless. It had a purpose. In Galatians 3, verse 23 through 24, Paul says, Before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. Now I'm not going to get off, that's not the purpose of our sermon, to get off on the reason for the law. Paul talks about that in Romans, and he talks about that in Galatians. The main point I want to make here is that there was a purpose, but we even see that that purpose was temporary. The law was our guardian. Some translations have that as the law was our tutor or our schoolmaster. Now, that's not a permanent position. We don't expect to send our children to schools forever. We don't expect them to need a tutor or a schoolmaster forever. A child may have a guardian that we don't expect them to need to be every decision to be made by that guardian forever. It's temporary. Paul says that is kind of like the nature of the Old Testament. It served a purpose through an infancy until the fullness of God's plan was revealed, and of course that was done in Christ. And because of all of these things, we see that the Old Testament or the Old Covenant has been abolished because it was just for Israel, Because it was not faultless, it was not the perfect plan, and because it was only meant to be temporary, it has ended. And uh, Matthew 5.17, and this may seem strange because I say that it's been abolished, but Jesus says, Matthew 5.17, I do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And so some people take that verse and they say, See, Jesus didn't come to abolish. He did not do away with the Old Testament. He came to fulfill them. Well, Jesus' life was not about destroying the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. But it was going to bring it to an end. And even Jesus alludes to that because Jesus says, I have come to fulfill it. Now, when you have a contract with somebody, think of a signed contract. When you have a contract, you and someone else agree to certain actions. Maybe it's the sale of a house. Someone agrees to buy your house. So they agree to pay X amount of dollars, and when they pay that money, 
you give them the keys to the house and it becomes their house. Now until that money is paid, the contract has not been fulfilled. Now you may sign the contract and you may have contingencies in the contract and you are both responsible for working toward that goal, but it's not fulfilled. But once the criterion have been met and the person pays their money and you give them the deed to the house and the keys to the house, is that contract still in effect? Well, no. That contract has been fulfilled. You have no further obligation to that person. They have no further obligation to you. The contract has been finished. Now, it, hasn't been, it wasn't destroyed prematurely, but it's been fulfilled. And that's what Jesus is saying. He is coming to fulfill the Old Covenant. He's coming to fulfill everything that the Law of Moses and the Old Covenant were looking forward to and promising and when he fulfills them, it'll be done. And he will bring in and establish a new covenant. I think we can see that that's the right way to interpret that. Because in Hebrews 8, it says, For if the first covenant, and this is beginning in verse 7, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now I've skipped verses 8 through 12, because verses 8 through 12 were just a direct quotation of what we just had up on the board from Jeremiah 31. But in verse 13, after that quotation, the Hebrew writer comes back and says, In speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Notice that. The old covenant has been made obsolete. Now that says something to us. That says that I cannot turn to the Old Testament to try and find authority from some practice that I want to engage in. Because that would be turning to an obsolete law. An obsolete law is a law that has no effect, that has no power. Now there's all sorts of laws that men have made over the years, and then they become obsolete and they're done away with. I can't go back to some law that was written in the 1700s and has since been done away with to try and get something that I want. It's obsolete. And the same is true of the Old Testament law. It is no longer a functioning covenant or a functioning law. It has been made obsolete. And then we've already mentioned this, but the obsoleteness is seen in the fact that it is not the fulfillment of God's promise. And I'm not going to go read this because it's several verses. But in Galatians 4, Paul uses what in my mind must have been a very scandalous uh, example, especially to a Jewish person. Over there, he uses the example of the story of Sarah and Hagar. If you remember that story, God had promised to Abraham that he would have a child, and that child would be uh, the recipient of the covenant, the renewed covenant with Abraham, and that was the child of promise. Well, Abraham and Sarah didn't think that that was going to happen because they were old. And so Sarah thought after a while, well, I'll give him my handmaiden Hagar, and, and, I, or, and that was the, boor, the birth of Ishmael. So Abraham had a child through Hagar. That was Ishmael. But God said, that's not the child of promise. And later on, God miraculously allowed Sarah to conceive and bear a son. That was Isaac, who was the son of promise. Now, speaking to people who are trying to stick to Judaism or bring Judaism into Christianity, Paul says, the church is like, he says, you can interpret this allegorically. And the church is like Isaac. And the people that stick to Judaism, the literal descendants of Isaac who stick with the old law are like Ishmael. And the child who at one point with his mother was finally cast out. That had to be incredibly offensive to Jewish minded people. But it was the truth. Why? Because the law of Moses and those that stuck to it were not the fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham, but those who would be buried with Christ, those who would be washed by the blood of the Messiah, those who would be Christians, were really the children of promise. But also, we see in Romans 7 another example that's used by Paul. This one, probably not as much of a slap in the face, but in some ways, still quite shocking. 
Paul uses our relationship to the old law like the relationship of a widow or a widower. In Romans 7, he uses the example uh, that people all accept that a, a woman is not, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. We understand this, and this isn't a sermon about marriage, but if two people are married, they're bound together. As Jesus says, what God has put together, let not man separate. Without going off into the exception that Jesus gives, that marriage is to last until death. And if that woman or that man goes and finds another wife or a husband, they're committing adultery. But if their spouse passes away, that marriage is ended. And they are not under bondage, they are not under law, and they are allowed to remarry. Paul uses this to teach about the Old Testament. He says, likewise, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. Take that to its logical conclusion. What Paul is saying is if you try and serve Christ through Christianity, through his law, but you also try and serve Christ and God through the Old Testament law, you're committing spiritual adultery. That would be akin to a woman having two husbands or a man having two wives. It's wrong. It can't happen. But also notice the implication. Paul says the Old Testament is dead. The Old Covenant is dead. We are not bound to it anymore. Instead, we are bound to Christ. So hopefully all of these things show us why the Old Covenant is not over us any longer. Let's speak about the New Covenant for just a few moments. First of all, we can see that it has been established. The New Covenant is not something that we're waiting for. It's not something that will be established when Jesus comes back. And so we're in some interim period, or we're waiting, or we're still under the Old Testament. It has been established. Hebrews 9, verses 14 through 17, verse 15 says, Therefore, Jesus, He is the mediator of a new covenant. Not he will be, not he's going to be, but he is the mediator of a new covenant. And the rest of that passage goes on to make the point that the way a will works, or a testament works, we understand what a will is when we're maybe planning for the future, and when we will no longer be here, we establish a last will and testament. Now until we die, we can change that will and testament all that we want to. It's not an effect. But once we die, it's set. And it goes into effect. Now there's not a perfect one-to-one correlation there because Jesus died, but then there was revelation still to come. But essentially, the point is this. When Jesus died, that was the fulfillment of the old law. And it was bringing into the era of the new covenant. And so all of us who live on this side of the cross, we can only find salvation in the new covenant because it has been established. But we also see that the new covenant is superior. And this is a study in and of itself. And it's a, if you want to go and study the book of Hebrews, it's a wonderful study. But we see the superior nature of the new covenant speaking or writing to people that were tempted to go back to Judaism, the Hebrew author shows how foolish that is by showing how much greater the new covenant is. When we try and go back in some form or fashion to the Old Testament, we are going from the greater to the lesser. We're taking a step down, spiritually speaking, and we shouldn't do that. Just a few things that Hebrew says, it tells us that the new covenant gives us a better hope. Why would you go back to something that doesn't offer as great of a hope as what we have? It is a better covenant. That's pretty plain and simple. It offers better promises. The New Testament or the Old Covenant had some pretty good promises, but nothing like the New Covenant. It is based upon a better sacrifice. Again, would you rather be washed by the blood of God's Son, or would you rather have your your sins rolled forward each and every year by the blood of animals? The New Covenant is a better covenant. We're told that it speaks a better word. I've mentioned this in a sermon not too long ago, but if you wanted to sum up the book of Hebrews, you could say in one word, better. 
The new covenant is better. And thus, we want to stick to the new covenant. We have to realize that we belong to the new covenant. Because it exists and it has been established, it's the only thing we can belong to to be saved. The old covenant has been abolished. It's been done away with. And so we live under the new covenant. And because we live under the new covenant, then we must abide by the law of the new covenant. And that, of course, is the law of Christ. And that law is revealed to us in the New Testament. And that's why we rely on the New Testament. Just a quick synopsis of how this works. In the Gospels, we see Jesus is shown to be the promised Messiah that God had foretold of. Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that the old covenant, the old covenants looked forward to and promised. And not only that, but they provide us his teaching as a new lawgiver. In the Gospels, you'll find, such as in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus saying, you have heard, and he'll quote sometimes verbatim the Old Testament, and he'll say, but I say unto you. Jesus isn't just reinterpreting. Jesus is giving laws. No prophet gave new laws, except for Moses. That really wasn't their prerogative after the covenant had been established. But Jesus comes along, and Jesus starts giving new laws. Why? Because he was establishing a new kingdom and a new covenant with a new law. Or like when he was saying to his disciples on the last evening, when he would say, a new command I give to you. What authority did Jesus have to give a new command? He had every authority because he is the Messiah. He is the King of kings. And he was establishing and has established a new kingdom. And the Gospels show us Jesus as the Messiah and the lawgiver of a New Testament. Acts shows us the history of the apostles as they carried out the Great Commission. It shows us the new kingdom law in action and thus gives us examples to follow as we seek to live under Christ's kingdom. The epistles provide spirit-given instruction to guide the church into the all-truth of the New Testament that Jesus promised would be made available. And the book of Revelation provides prophecy concerning the last days, that is the future, that is really now. The last days are the time between the inauguration of the church and Christ's return. They are called the last days because there's nothing else coming. There's no further revelation. There's no new prophecy coming. There's no new change in the covenant coming. This is it. So the last days have already lasted for around 2,000 years. And even if the world goes on for 10,000 more, it will still be in the last days because there's nothing new coming. And the book of Revelation teaches us of the victory that will come when the last days are ended. When the last days are ended, that's when the world ends. That's when Jesus comes back to take the faithful home. Well, for just a couple minutes, I do want to make a couple of comments about the purpose of the Old Testament. We live, I hope I've shown, at least to a degree, why we live under the New Testament. But showing that the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, was not faultless, that it's been made obsolete, that it's been abolished, can give the wrong idea. And I've seen this. I see this even in the church sometimes, where people come to the conclusion, well, because it was old and obsolete and we live under the New Testament, do away with it. We don't need it. I've known people that would only read the New Testament. They would only own a New Testament. They thought that's all you should ever teach from. Hopefully you've paid attention enough in my sermons to realize I teach from the Old Testament. And not irregularly. But why? Is that appropriate? Well, I think it is appropriate. But what is the purpose of the Old Testament? Well, first of all, it is to provide learning. Just because we no longer live under its law does not mean that it has nothing to teach us. Paul said in Romans 15 and 4 that whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. Now Paul argues extensively in Romans that we don't live under the old law. But that doesn't mean it's time to throw out those 39 books of the Old Testament. Paul says you can learn from them. You can gain hope and comfort from them. And they are Scripture. And Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There is a lot of learning 
to be done in the Old Testament. In fact, the Old Testament serves as the foundation for the New. I've read, I've not gone through and added it up, but I've read many writers that have made the point that if you were to take out all of the Old Testament quotes and allusions in the New Testament, you would lose about 10% of the New Testament. When the apostles were preaching, they often referred, especially when they were preaching to Jews, they referred back to the Old Testament. Why? Because they were going to use the Old Testament to show why people should follow Christ. Because the Old Testament, here's the, what, you, what we can't get wrong, the Old Testament does not contradict Christianity. The Old Testament, the Old Covenant looks forward to it. And those who really looked at the Old Covenant with honest hearts and open hearts realized Jesus is what it was promising. So why would you go back to just what was being promised when what was promised has come? But therein lies some very valuable information. We can learn even more about Jesus in the Old Testament. One time in a different place we were going through a series, uh, well, it wasn't here, but going through a series about the Bible, just doing overviews of the Bible. And we'd gone through several Old Testament books when somebody made the comment to me, I, I think we just need to teach on Jesus more. Basically, the interpretation is, let's quit talking about this Old Testament stuff. And that was crushing to me, because from the very beginning, I had tried to make the point that the purpose of the Old Testament was to look forward to Jesus. And as we were going through the Old Testament books, me and the other teachers were trying to show how they pointed to Jesus and what they taught us about Jesus. You can learn a lot about Christ in the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. You can learn about Christ's sacrifice and its importance by reading a boring book like Leviticus. You can learn a lot about Christ from the prophecies of the Old Testament. And so when we neglect the Old Testament, we neglect the opportunity to deepen our appreciation of and understanding of Christ and His purpose and His work. We lose the opportunity to understand more about just the story of redemption. Isn't it interesting that God didn't solve the sin problem like that after man sinned in the garden? Instead, He took roughly 4,000 years to bring Jesus onto the scene. Now, if God, in His infinite wisdom, took that time to prepare to help man solve the problem of sin, don't you think it's, a, it's worth reading about it and learning from it and why God would do that? I certainly do. We can learn principles from the Old Testament. While we don't look to the Old Testament for authority, we do realize that God and Jesus are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so when you see something that God hates in the Old Testament, it's a pretty safe bet that He still hates it today. You can learn principles about worship. Now, do we get authority for how we worship from the Old Testament? No. But do we learn about the importance of worship from the Old Testament? Yes. Do we learn about the importance of obeying God and doing it as God says? Yes. When we try and teach why we want to just do just what the Bible says, usually where we go is we go back to Leviticus and we talk about the story of Nadab and Abihu. Because even though we don't offer sacrifices and burn incense the way that Nadab and Abihu do, we learn an important principle, and that is that when you presume to do what you want in worship, it angers God. Now, we might not expect to be consumed with fire and burned alive on the spot for changing worship to suit our whims. But we learn a principle all the way back there that when God tells you how to worship, you worship how God has told you to. And so when we look to our law of the New Testament, we abide by it. and We learn a great principle from the Old Testament. The prophecy can be a wonderful thing to study in the Old Testament and bolster our faith and scriptures. But as I've already alluded to, we do have to recognize that the purpose of the Old Testament is not to provide authority. We do not turn to the Old Testament to learn how to worship. And one thing I've seen is people usually pick and choose about this anyway. Because people want to use instruments. And so they go back to the book of Psalms, and they go back to other places where sometimes musical instruments weren't just allowed, in some cases were commanded. And they say, well, if they used it back then, why couldn't we use it now? And yet they don't want to burn incense. 
in church. And they don't want us to set up an altar and kill a bull in church. And so really, we're kind of hypocritical, I say we generally, when we want to pick things from the Old Testament. But what we see is the old has been abolished. Were musical instruments a part of the old covenant system of worship? Yes, they were. But they're not in the New Testament. And so we don't use them in the New Testament. Now, worship was a part of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. But we worship under the guidance and instruction of the New Testament. With ethics and morality. We're not going to find a whole lot of difference from the ethics of the Old Testament and the New Testament, but you'll find some. Well, God did not approve of it, under the Old Covenant, God at least allowed multiple marriages. You can look at men that were righteous, even men like David, who had multiple wives. Is that allowed under the New Covenant? No. You can see divorce. While God hated divorce, the law of the Old Covenant was looser than the law of the New Covenant. You see, our morality and our ethics are governed by the New Covenant. We can learn a great deal about morality and ethics and behavior from the Old Covenant, but we abide by the New Covenant. The way God's people are governed. And on and on the list could go. The point is this. We do not gain our authority from the Old Covenant. And for us to do so is to return to something that has been abolished and made obsolete and leave behind what the Old Covenant was pointing forward to in the first place. And so that's why Christians rely upon the New Testament. Well, that's the study for this evening. And I hope that it's helpful. I hope that it, I think this is something that most of us probably understand. Uh, If not, then I hope that this has clarified things, or I hope that it's at least bolstered your understanding of why it is that we rely so heavily on the New Covenant. We don't want to close the service without extending an invitation. Perhaps there's somebody here who has never obeyed the gospel and you have the opportunity to do that tonight. And we want to extend that invitation to you. If you believe in Christ as the Son of God, are ready to repent of your sins and confess Him as the Son of God, then why why not make the choice also to be baptized for the remission of your sins? Or if there's a Christian here who would desire the prayers of the church on their behalf, we'd be happy to pray with you and for you. So if there be one in need, we'd invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.